So a technocratic government, by definition, does not have uh, political support, right? So that's the weakness. It cannot introduce major changes. It cannot introduce, or rarely can it introduce, major reforms. It can just run the government, right? Because in order to introduce any radical changes, bills, you need to pass them to the parliament. You need to have a majority. That's what was missing, right? So that's one of the important uh, weaknesses of technocratic government. They can rarely do big things, and they don't have the polit political support. So they're short-lasting, short-lived, by design. All right. Well, 2010 brings about certain uh, sort of, and I told you, this is kind of the third, um, sort of a third uh, stage in, in, in the political history since 1989. <coughs> because it brings, not just in, not just here, uh, think about Poland, but you'll see it also in other countries. 2010, it's sort of a, a watershed in, in, in a way, sort of that, that period. So what you see immediately is that there are some names here that I don't, you don't recognize, right? The previous parties that kind of oscillated, came in and out of government were kind of the same names, not anymore. The third party here suddenly is Top 09, which is actually Tradition, uh, Responsibility, Prosperity. That's the acronym. 09, because that's what it was formed. And actually, it's a, f uh, it's a, f um, it's a, a party that fact it's a faction of the of the Christian Democrats. Christian Democrats who do not make it into the parliament, just barely f fail. <coughs> Here's the party of civic rights of Zemanovci, which is actually the party of Milor Zeman, who used to be the, the Social Democratic pre PM. He left the Social Democrats, formed his own party, which doesn't make it into the parliament. The Green Party also falls outside of the, of the, of the uh, uh, parliament. And also, I wanted to add and uh, point out the Czech Pirate Party. Pirate parties are a, a very interesting phenomenon in European politics in the 2000s. Uh, and they have to do with, and I think I mentioned them in the political ideologies lecture uh, that you have there for reference. If um, is this uh, uh, this there is a wave in world politics, but also uh, European politics, and more specifically in the 2000s, of uh, uh, push towards a sort of a populist party uh, political forces that feed on the public's disaffection with the existing party and political systems, with the, with the status quo. People are being tired of the same old parties and kind of wanting something new and direct. Add to this the impact of the internet, uh, because many of these, part, the, specifically the pirate party, but others as well, they form on the internet, based on the internet, with the tools of the internet, because the internet is seen, is seen, is seen as, the, as a sort of a... Uh, a way out of the problem, right? A way out of the system. The internet is a tool of direct democracy. So the pirate party, uh, pirate parties actually form, and the name comes from the fact that these were hackers, basically, uh, originally. And it, it has this idea that you know the internet is this platform of direct, of full democracy, of freedom, right? Where everything should be freely available, blah blah blah. Uh, and let's apply those things, you know, the sort of a direct democracy freedom out with everyone, also in politics. So this is basically how uh, you know, pirate parties uh, have formed. And I just left it in because it's an interesting phenomenon that happens throughout Europe and also you see Central Europe, not just Western Europe. In other parts of Europe, in Scandinavia, they want some mayors, races and some more important positions. They don't last long, these populist parties, these direct democracy parties, I call them. Uh, which come about as a reaction to the tiredness of the system. But it's interesting that it's also present here. Which takes us to again back to our uh, thing here. So Top 09 is a Christian democratic, sort of a modeled on the Western Christian democratic country, uh, Christian democratic um, parties. And if you don't know what Christian democracy stands for, again, my lecture on political ideologies is right there. Christian democracy. Um, so typical Christian democracy, which is pro European pro-market, uh, but also traditional values and so on, family and so on. And that's top of nine. And its leader is an interesting character, um, Karl Schwarzenberg. The name doesn't sound Czech because yes. <laughs> it's an actual an ancient Czech-Austrian noble family. And he's a noble, basically, of, 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 of 
we didn't hear such doesn't exist anymore in Czech Republic, but the families of noble descent, his wife is actually Austrian or German, and uh, so he, he's, he's on that model of Christian democracy, which is, for example, very successful in Austria or Germany. So. Good. Then you have VV, which is public affairs, which is, well, if you remember what I talked about in Poland, and again I told you 2010 is sort of a watershed moment. It is a watershed because I mentioned in the last lecture that there is this sort of a fatigue, post-transition fatigue in Central Eastern Europe, I would argue. Your book doesn't talk about it. Uh, post-transition uh, uh, fatigue, in which, which has to do with those enormous expectations that were there in 1989 of, of we're going to transition to uh, freedom, uh, prosperity, and Europe and everything together, and it doesn't work like that. It does not work like that. So, and then you see that, uh, you see all the problems and the messiness of democracy. And you also see elites, the political elites, those who were ready and to, to occupy the political positions and the economic positions, and which is not the majority of the people, right? It's, the, it's a niche of people and elite. Not elite because they're better, but elite because they're fewer. Um, and and the same elites kind of move in and out, and you don't see your life improving necessarily. But many people, you know, had that experience, right? With the rising inequality, unemployment, and other things that come with, you know, uh, all these, uh, we talked about social effects of these transitions. So, all of this sort of, you know, kind of peaks around 2010, and in that period, in many several of these countries, as you see this post-democratic fatigue, and you have the appearance of parties that, or at least uh, uh, appearance of parties and of rhetoric that says, 1989, we need to recover, rethink, regain, recon uh, reconquer 1989. So, some of the parties you see in Hungary uh, will come in with a rhetoric of it was a stolen 1989. We didn't, we didn't go far enough in 1989. We're going to do the real 1989 today, right? Or it's going to say the 1989 has been, has been derailed, has, been, has, been, has not been fulfilled, has been captured by these elites. And what you hear here, what you hear, right, in this rhetoric is, are two things, right? There's an anti-status quo rhetoric which is usually directed to the fact that here's this elite of politics in most of Central Europe, Eastern European countries people are kind of cynical about politics they don't trust politicians, they don't trust parties has many same reasons and so on in general, they don't really involve with parties uh, which has to do with communism because you could not trust and obviously nobody trusted the communist party but it has to do with that, in, in, you know, not trusting politics itself um, and then, especially then you're having that euphoria of 1989 and then, you know, things don't become a paradise overnight and arguably never. Um, so, so, you hear this anti-status quo in, in this sort of rhetoric, right, in this sort of a message. Um, status quo that is these elites that have been around since the 1990s and we're sick and tired of them. And, in, in, and you see in the Czech Republic kind of the same figures travel in and out, although parties change, but the figures don't change that much. And then you um, also hear perhaps a reference to that aspect of 1989 that I mentioned several times, the huge, the gigantic, the enormous expectations of, of, of radical change, right? which any revolution brings with it. Any revolution brings with it. It's, it's part of in, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the nature of a revolution because it wants to change everything, but you know, Human nature doesn't change, and ch things don't happen, all right? We talked about transition, how it's a very piecemeal, even if it's fast, and it was immensely fast, in, especially in these countries. But, you know, uh, it's still gradual in many ways, right? So, so these huge expectations that are not fulfilled overnight, right? So this reference of, oh, let's re... Let's do that. Let's do that. Let's fulfill those immense expectations. How? Well, here's where these actors will bring a different response to it will bring a, a different answer to that. And in Hungary you'll see that uh, one of the important parties will, will do the same thing, but will give a different answer. So, you know, it's almost like 1989 is a question mark, well, it's not a, you know, just an exclamation sign, but a question mark that was never answered, right? We change everything, but then you don't get what was promised, so to speak. Nobody promised it, but, you know, sort of you promised it to yourself. 
So that's, these are the two things that uh, seem to be going on in several of these countries, and I think Poland, we talked about it. So public affairs is uh, such a party, basically. It's a, it comes on an anti-corruption uh, platform. Actually, it was led by an, a journalist, right? Very Italian, an investigative journalist who, <coughs> truth, you know, think the law and justice party in Poland, right? Truth, order, cleaning, all those things. Okay. So, uh, what happens? Who forms a government? Well, a new government is formed with ODS uh, top, which was immensely successful here, and this public affairs VV. So they have enough, they have enough to notice the losses so suffered by the social democrats. But also by ODS, by the way. All of them suffer significant losses. But they form a um, fiscally conservative government. This is 2000. Uh, 10, this is two years after the economic crisis, Greece, the Greece economic, uh, you know, disaster is going on right now, uh, Hungary is going through a tremendous, just before that, through, through a tremendous economic crisis, almost disaster, so this is a government that comes in on a platform of fiscal responsibility, we're not going to overspend, we're not going to be a Greece, we need to manage the economy, and they all agree on that. However, between 2010 and 2013, guess what? This anti-corruption force here falls completely apart because its leaders are discovered to be corrupt <laughs> or to be involved in various corruption the disasters. Um, furthermore, the ODS Prime Minister, Petr Necas, and uh, I have posted an article um, on Canvas uh, regarding both of these issues, uh, he also resigns, the Prime Minister, the ODS Prime Minister, resigns because of his own complications in private life and in misuse of public funds and all such nonsense. So, this is a disaster. I mean, this anti-corruption thing falls apart. ODS suffers greatly because this has been already, they have been around since 1990. They, uh, they uh, suffer greatly. So, what happens in 2013? You have early elections. You have early elections because the government falls apart because of corruption scandals. Now, notice how this just reinforces this whole anti-system, anti-status quo, uh, uh, cynicism with politics, uh, disgust, uh, whatever, right? The disappointment with the whole political elite. You have this guy who comes in and gets voted in as a fourth party, VV, right? Public Affairs, who comes on a platform of uh, anti-corruption, the investigative journalist, and he <laughs> becomes one of the targets, one of the elements of a corruption scandal. I mean, if, if even, you, know, you vote in the reformers and they turn out to be just like the other guys. Can you imagine the impact of that? Uh, okay, 2013, this will, you know, uh, some disasters have effects in, in, in politics. So again, what do you see? New forces. Um, not, this is the presidential election. Here. You see new forces again. Anno 2011, which is uh, uh, actually the, an acronym that stands for Action of Dissatisfied Citizens. Action of Dissatisfied Citizens. But also the acronym means yes in Czech, Anno. So, Action of Dissatisfied Citizens. Well, it kind of tells you what this party is for and about. Okay? Action of Dissatisfied Citizens. Uh, it's a populist party, comes as a reaction to all these corruption scandals and so on. Led by a rich businessman. You know, whenever you have a journalist or a businessman or whatever coming into politics, they always come on the platform. I'm going to tell you, like, if they're not a politician, whatever, as if they would not be part of politics once they get voted in. Anyway, the, corruption, the platform is anti corruption, anti system, anti status quo. Liberal economically, meaning uh, you know pro market and so on, but with social protection and vaguely euro skeptic. So basically, anti corruption populism. That's Anno 2011. Another party that uh, gets into the parliament, new dawn of direct democracy. Uh, wonderful name, right? Dawn of direct democracy. It's exactly what I was telling you about, right? Just like a pirate party. This idea that we need to change the system from the ground up. We need to have direct democracy, that people should directly govern themselves as if that would be the solution for every problem, but you know, we have the internet and everything, so that's, that's it. And these are these populist forces, they win elections in Italy, they win elections in Czech Republic, you know, it's, it's a worldwide uh, phenomenon. Um, so yeah, a populist anti-corruption party, it's interesting, the leader of this party is a Japanese Czech businessman, 
of uh, so this is of Japanese Czech, you know, a Japanese origin, but Czech citizen, Tomi Okamura, <coughs> or maybe of a mixed uh, father and mother, uh, mixed family. And, you know, he advocates direct democracy, an expanded use of referendum and recall. Recall, right? Recall vote being that vote by which you can vote to remove someone from office directly as a citizen. Throw out the bombs, right? Uh, and also nationalist, because populists are not necessarily democratic in, the, in other ways, right? The voice of the people means many things. Can mean the voice of the nation, and that can mean nationalism. So he's, he has this anti-Gypsy rhetoric as well. He is strongly Eurosceptic or skeptical about the European Union, so more Czech sovereignty. So you see direct democracy, populism, but also kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, nationalist and so on. So think Tea Party, right? Or think uh, Occupy movement, right? It's not about left or right here. They're also populist movements and they also have their own accents of whatever sort. Sorry. Okay, so notice that both these parties form around personalities and not around their ideas. Anno and uh, um, Donald Direct Democracy, right? They're about around people, this businessman, this Japanese, Czech, whatever, and about, it's a reaction to the system, it's not an ideology. These parties don't last long. Okay, um, so, who forms the government? Well, the Social Democrats, who get barely 50 uh, 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 seats, notice how much the second party is this Anno 2011. Action of dissatisfied, dissatisfied citizens. The dissatisfied citizens produce the second largest party in the system. And in lines with the back, again, the Christian Democrats will get back into the party. Okay? And they will form the party. <coughs> so the Social Democrats. But who is president at this time? Well, in 2013, I skipped this, you have the first direct election to the presidency the first direct election to the presidency. So, 2013, that direct election to the presidency, which is done on the system of uh, single member district two ballots, which means that, what does it mean? It means uh, there are two ballots. In the first ballot, all candidates run for the president, and here you have them, right? These are all candidates who run in the first ballot, right? These are different candidates for the presidency. And then, if no, nobody gets a majority, since the president needs to be elected by a majority of the population, the first two, those who take the two most votes in the first round, get to the second round. And you see who were the candidates. Miller Zeman, our old friend, who used to be prime minister for the Social Democrats, then formed his own party, and now runs for the presidency for his, with his own party, not for the Social Democrats. Right? And top 09s that aristocrat Karl Schwarzenberg. And Karl Schwarzenberg loses very narrowly here, but more in the, in the second round, uh, where you know the, these votes get redistributed. Now, <clears throat> I also posted a link in all of the documents to an um, electoral map of the Czech Republic, which you should check again, uh, because just like in Poland, you will see this division between East and West, this regional cleavage. Where, because usually the east of these countries are less developed than the west. It's this, this pendulum, it's balance. Uh, more rural, less uh, industrialized, and so on. And this reflects, this reflects on elections. So the social democrats, the center left, right, those who need more benefits from the state, the east, right, versus the most more urban, pro European, uh, whatever, the west. And that applies even to a, such a small country as Czech Republic, which will vote for Schwarzenberg. Schwarzenberg will have the, most of the west and uh, Zeman the East. Interesting. Okay, so that happens actually before the parliamentary election, so in the, when the government is formed, it's an interesting thing happens, because again, as you notice, there is no clear majority. So Zeman, Miller Zeman, this former social democrat now with his own thing, but still center-left, <laughs> will have a say in asking someone to form a government. The interesting thing is that social democrats will form a government, you're gonna say yes, because he used to be part of it, and he's going to ask his own former party, no. In the Social Democratic Party, there were two factions, one closer to Zeman, one farther, you know, he's no longer part of that party, but still there's a part of the party which is closer to him, one is farther to him, at this point he's already president, right, when the parliamentary elections happen. Well, uh, it's, the part, it's the part of the Social Democrats that is against Zeman that actually wins the day. So the Prime Minister that is appointed in uh, 2013, um, 
and his name is uh, uh, Sobotka, and he's still the prime minister. <coughs> he's actually the faction of the social democrats that is kind of against Miloš Zeman, the, the current uh, president. So you have a sort of a cohabitation. Because at this point, since the president is directly elected, I'm going to argue that this is a weak semi presidential model. Especially since Zeman is kind of more pushing for a more active role. So within this weak semi presidential model, you have a sort of a cohabitation because the president is from one faction, has definitely no, his part is not even in parliament, by the way, but he's one faction, while the government that was formed is a social democratic party that doesn't like him. Uh, this reform movement, We'll see how long it lasts, and the Christian Democrats. So a very weird mix. It's a strange mix. In any case, that's that's who is the uh, that's who are the, uh, that, those are the parties in power even today. Okay, so after this review of elections, what can we say? Right? We saw politics in the 90s, two major polls, but many parties fracturing around these two major polls. Then the 2000s, uh, <coughs> kind of this left to right kind of continues, but then there's this breakdown in the political system sort of towards the 2010s, uh, corruption scandals which actually followed Czech politics since the 90s, <coughs> an increased disappointment accentuated by these corruption scandals among the population with, with the entire political uh, elite, and after the 2000s the emergence of all these reform anti-system populist forces which don't know where it will go. So at this point what we see here is a um, political sphere that is very much in flux, very much moving. I'm not sure where, which way it is going. Um, <coughs> for example, uh, notice that um, uh, ODS 7% barely makes it in the party. This is the party that has dominated Czech politics again, uh, with the Social Democrats since 1989. Barely makes it to Parliament. Will they survive? For example? Okay. Um, what will happen to these anti-system parties or anti-status quo reform parties? Um, so, it's interesting to see. Also, the relatively high vote received by the Communists, 33 out of 200, is also an anti-system, anti-status quo uh, protest vote. Well, this being said, uh, a few more issues about Czech politics, and with that we will conclude. One issue that needs to be mentioned is the situation of the Roma population, because I mentioned it, of the Romani, the Gypsy, which is an ethnic group present in all the countries of Central Eastern Europe, but in Czech Republic and Slovakia and Hungary, and Romania especially, and Bulgaria in larger numbers. So, you know, they're actually very present. And in the Czech Republic, it's, it's, it is an unsolved problem. And your book mentions a few things about it. Uh, uh, and problems range for the unemployment rate among the gypsy are it's about 85 percent imagine that very low levels of education social exclusion I meaning they live in sort of you know usually in rural areas or uh, kind of uh, outskirts of city of of, town, of cities <coughs> in, in areas which only are only inhabited by roma or you know gypsy they call themselves roma nowadays um, that's a political correct name uh, so the roma um, and uh, they, so there's this social exclusion, which is reciprocal, sort of auto-exclusion, but also social exclusion. Uh, they're not integrated into the uh, society, their living socioeconomic level of life is very low, very poor, uh, many don't have electricity and so on. So there's huge, huge problems with integrating this part of the population culturally and economically and socially in the society. And in general, in the society, there's a very negative view of uh, this uh, population, there's a high rate of crime uh, uh, among them, uh, and uh, so tremendous problems, tremendous problems, and there's no clear uh, solution. There has been several, there have been several waves of emigration of the Roma after Czech Republic became part of the EU and so on, and they just left for other countries or for in mass, on, or for Canada. So much so that Canada reintroduced the visas for the Czech Republic just because of so many Roma gypsies were coming. Uh, over the same happens in uh, in France and so on. So it's a very complicated problem, but it needs mentioning because it is definitely not a solved problem. And you will we will encounter this uh, issue in uh, both Hungary and uh, Romania as well. Okay. Um, uh, regarding uh, foreign policy, uh, so I mentioned other issues that you know corruption and so on. Uh, uh, sort of disaffection with the political system and so on. 
uh, let me uh, say a few uh, words about foreign uh, policy. Uh, Czech Republic becomes a member of NATO in 1999 together with Poland and Hungary, member of EU in 2004 with uh, nine other countries. Um, we is a member of the Visegrad for uh, reluctantly in the 90s when it was going so well that it didn't want to be bothered, but nowadays both Poland, Czech, Slovak and Hungary have discovered that it's good to work closely together because Central East Europe does have common interests which they can defend better and, and promote better in the EU and in NATO. For example, uh, you know, the posi their position towards Russia and the Russian intervention in Ukraine and so on is different from then the position of some Western European countries, right? Because these these countries have been Central Eastern European have been at the border, right, between <laughs> Europe and Russia. So uh, several other things in which they discovered that they have they can cooperate better when they speak with the one voice. And the recent migrants crisis and the ongoing refugee crisis in Europe also is a case where these countries have acted together, both also military uh, and in security issues, uh, because they saw the issue with the same eyes. We will bring this up together again later. Okay, and just to conclude, uh, another issue that is worth talking about is the fact that just like Poland, the Czech Republic has played an active role in supporting democratizing movements around the world, but for example to the east of that, for example in Ukraine. We have been supporters, material and otherwise, of uh, democratic forces in Ukraine, especially after the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. Although, and here's an interesting story, aspect that Milos Zeman, the current president, who used to be social democrat, is kind of a fellow Russian, so he's less enthusiastic about it. So that was a short, not so short review of the chair.